Taiwan, a country I'm proud to say I'm from, in my career as a media entrepreneur. I've spoken to movers and shakers here who make global headlines. But what I'm most excited about are the up and coming forces of my generation. They're young, they're creative, they dare to defy the status quo. Follow me as I meet emerging leaders of Taiwan who lift us, who inspire us, who are changing the world, starting in Taiwan. This is Game Changers with Emily Wiley. Hey, welcome to the show. If this is your first time here, I'm so happy you could join us. And after the episode today, be sure to check out more fun shows from Taiwan Plus, the official English channel for Taiwan. Today, we talk about food. Taiwan is a food nation. Foods like pineapples and mangoes and bananas and beef noodle soups and xiaolong baos and boba teas and all these wonderful things we call little eats. Make a visit to Taiwan, and I guarantee you, you are going to eat your way through. Our guest today, Lillian Lin. She and her team at Yunhai Taiwanese Pantry are bringing Taiwanese food to the world. Lillian was born in New York. She grew up in Taipei, and in her 20s, she traveled the world sampling foods and curating them to curious customers. She then ran operations for Myers Group, and that's Meyer of the Danish restaurant Noma for y'all, you foodies. And here's Lillian, who's bringing Taiwanese food to the world. Hi, so good to see you. I'm so happy you can join us today. You normally live in San Francisco. Yeah, I do. Uh, I live in San Francisco most of the time, and I go to New York every one or two months to visit the store and visit the rest of the team. First of all, how's it being back? What do you eat when you come back to Taiwan? What you <laughs> eat? Well, the first thing I eat when I land is some fan tuan rice rolls to kick off the day and drink some mee jiang because it's really hard to get that in the States. And yeah, shout out all the way for sure. Okay, I'm so happy you and your colleagues are bringing Taiwanese food to North America, making it so hip. And we're going to talk all about that today. Sounds good. Well, so growing up here, everything is snacks. We got pineapple snacks and apple snacks and mango snacks. Mm -hmm. um, pineapple is such an important fruit to us. It is. And in 2021, uh, China banned the mm -hmm. import of pineapples from Taiwan, and this caused this momentary shock. Mm -hmm. um, but what ended up happening was it showed how resilient that Taiwanese were during that time. Mm -hmm. In four days, Taiwanese in Taiwan, we bought up a whole year's worth of pineapples. It was something at the time called the freedom pineapples. Mm -hmm. Government got involved, influencer got involved, individuals, we just try to buy up as many pineapples as we can. And the thing is, at the time, I got a lot of messages from my friends in America, Taiwanese mm -hmm. Americans who said, what can I do? And I was at a total loss. I don't, I don't know. But it turned out you had a solution to this. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So the problem is exactly as you described. Um, you know, in Taiwan, all the Taiwanese people were trying to support and buy pineapples, but overseas, it was just really difficult, especially in the US, to ship fresh pineapples all the way there. And people were like, how do we support it? How do we support the farmers? And that's when Lisa and I started thinking about, oh, maybe we can turn these pineapples into dried pineapples and then ship them to the States. Lisa is the founder of Yunhai. Yes, so Lisa had founded Yunhai in 2019. So we thought, Maybe we can buy the pineapples from the farmers and turn them into dried pineapples, then send it to the U.S. And so that's when we came up with the idea to do a Kickstarter um, to gather all the funds to support these farmers and essentially create like an evergreen kind of route for these farmers to sell their pineapples to the States, not just in a one-time purchase. We wanted it to be an ongoing relationship. So maybe the Kickstarter started the relationship, but over time, the next few years, we can continue to buy these fruits from the farmers to reduce their dependence on the Chinese export market. Supporting local independent farmers was something already that Minghai was doing. Yeah, so when the pineapple ban happened, we knew we wanted to support these small independent farmers. Um, but at the same time, as we know, Taiwan has such an amazing abundance of fruit. And I think, you know, if you haven't gone to Taiwan to eat the fresh fruit, it's hard to imagine how good the fruits are. But once you're here, you really know. And, you know, dried mangoes, dried fruits here are just completely different from the ones you see in the U.S. You know, the U.S. ones have, you know, lots of sugar added. Um, they're not as natural as the dried fruits we get here. And so we thought, okay, if we're gonna do pineapple, why don't we bring the best of Taiwanese fruits too? So that's why we also had mango, guava, and even wax apple, which is not is kind of hard to find in Taiwan in the dried form as well. So during that ban, you ended up buying 14 tons. <laughs> yes. 
How much is that? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. So I think we initially aimed to, you know, raise like 20,000 US dollars or so to buy the fruits. And um, there was just so much overwhelming support for Taiwan and the word spread really quickly. And so we ended up raising about, you know, 110K USD for these fruits and ended up buying, you know, like you said, about 14 tons of fresh fruit, which is equivalent to something like 40,000 pieces of fruits. It basically fits kind of like a 20 foot container. You see those containers on the road, filled to the brim, tons of fruits. Um, to get a sense, a 20 foot container can fit something like 35 couches inside. Oh my gosh. So it's a lot of fruit. <laughs> well, something else that your company is really important, the work that you do is that you're helping um, small businesses and independent farmers and producers to figure out logistics, mm -hmm. right? Because um, I'd imagine as a small producer, I don't know how to export to the US, but yeah. I might have a market there. So you're helping them to unlock that. Yeah. How difficult is that? I mean, how difficult is, was it to have, uh, to get a new import license to the US? Yeah, so actually importing food, believe it or not, is simpler than you think. It's a lot of paperwork that you get together, but essentially what we do is we try and take care of all that paperwork on behalf of the farmers and the small businesses so that they can just focus on producing the best product and we can help them transport it. You know, help them register with the FDA, make sure the labels are correct in the American format, and then the rest is the food inside. The nutritional values. The yeah, all that kind of stuff. <laughs> How long is this process? Uh, I'd say it usually takes a couple of months, maybe like three to four months to get everything together. It takes a while to design the packaging, print the packaging. There's usually a minimum order quantity that you need to meet, and then they put it on boxes. And believe it or not, some of the smallest things for making these products happen are the little things. Like maybe we want to create a bag of dried pineapple. So we make the bag, but then after you make the bag, you need to think, oh, now I need to make the boxes, the bags go in. You have to custom make those boxes. And then you need a bigger box for those boxes to go in. So it's actually a whole process. Um, but yeah, then afterwards we send all them to the farmers, they pack it up for us, we palletize them, and then put it in a container and ship it off. So you have e-commerce um, that you sell to North America, to the mm -hmm. US and Canada, and you have yeah. a physical store in New York. Yeah. So Out of everything you sell, how much of it is coming from independent producers who normally otherwise would not be able to sell to North America? Yeah, I'd say probably 100% of our products are from small independent producers. Um, generally, they are, so as you probably know recently in Taiwan, there's a lot of second and third generation kids who've taken over their family's food businesses, like old soy sauce companies, sesame oil companies, and they've rebranded them, packaged them beautifully. And you can see them in a lot of stores in Taiwan, like at S. Lead, at Maji Food in Delhi, but that hasn't really made its way to the States. In the States, the grocery stores still have the traditional like Kim Lan soy sauce, and those are great as well. But there's so much craft and story behind these products that's not told. Um, so we want to help them tell that story and bring that to the States. Yeah, let's talk about that. How you sell Asian food, Taiwanese food to mm -hmm. North American audience. Because traditionally, um, mm -hmm. in the States, for example, Asian food markets is something that only we go to. <laughs> yes. <right? laughs> the food there is, they're very mysterious. The public just not very familiar with. Mm -hmm. What you're doing now is making Taiwanese food really hip in the US. I mean, just to take a look at the shop that you have in New York, I think it spells, this is so cool. I want to go there, I want to be there, I want to buy something from here. Yeah. So what is your secret sauce? What is that ingredient that no one else kind of figured out before now? Um, first, definitely want to credit all of that, most of that to Lisa for sure. Because ultimately, like maybe similar to your experience, you know, she grew up in Texas and from a half Taiwanese, half American family. And there are a lot of times when there's Taiwanese food that she enjoyed, but has no idea of how to cook it or how to prepare it. And all of the content on how to cook it and prepare it was in Mandarin at the time. And so I think that's maybe a similar issue facing lots of first and second gen Taiwanese American uh, kids in the States. And so part of the goal is to provide the access to those ingredients and to that heritage uh, through food and in an English first format. And there just hasn't been too many people trying to do that at all. And then I think ultimately the, you know, we write newsletters, Instagram posts, um, and the voice that comes through that is one of genuine curiosity and appreciation for Taiwan. And it's just a very authentic, like, how do I make this? What is this thing that I see on the shelf? I have no idea how to use it. 
and really kind of relating to people in a very, very nostalgic and childhood way almost. And that seems to have really resonated, I think. So one way of selling uh, soy sauce is is um, the dishes that you can eat the soy sauce with. Mm -hmm. But yeah. that's not what you do. You have a storytelling about Taiwan. Yeah, yeah. So for the soy sauce, a great example. Um, so for the soy sauce, we actually produced this short sort of 13 minute documentary about the soy sauce producers. Because actually, you know, I eat soy sauce all the time, but I have no idea how it's made. And specifically in Taiwan, the traditional way is to make soy sauce with black soybeans, which is different from China, which makes it with yellow soybeans. And the flavor, as you know, like when you eat soy sauce in Taiwan, it might taste a little bit different from the ones you get in China. And it's because of the way they make it, the craft behind it is totally different. And so we want to tell the story through video, through cameras, through uh, text to kind of showcase not just the product, but the whole story behind it. Um, I think in the States right now, there's been a renaissance of Taiwanese American restaurants. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so I think we're really lucky to be part of this new wave of Taiwanese sort of restaurants in New York. There's a beef noodle soup place, like um, like a Re Cao hot stir fry type of place. There's a Taiwanese American fusion restaurant. So there's a bunch of them. And I think together, they're putting Taiwanese food on the map again. And we're part of that wave, I think, um, belatedly, but joining that crowd. And it's been a great community of people. We work together. Some of them use our ingredients in their dishes. Um, we help some of them sell their products. And it's a great community to be in because our goal is to promote Taiwan and we can do it on our own way. Yeah. And just to dig deeper about the things you carry, like what are some of these other things that as a logistics um, company, it's easier to do um, than not? Or is it something that the American market actually liked a little bit better? Yeah, yeah. So I think for us, um, we started out as a pantry shop to help people cook all the flavors that they miss and love from their childhood. So we started with soy sauce, sesame oil, chili oil to kind of recreate that flavor. And then slowly we can grow that into more snacks and even some lifestyle goods. So as you know, part of an important part of Taiwanese cooking is the da tong dian guo, the da tong rice cooker and steamer. And so we started selling that this year to help people complete that Taiwanese cooking experience. What about like for like a first time uh, Taiwanese food uh, person, what should they try? Yeah, I think all the xiaoqi is for sure classic of that agrarian society. Taiwanese kind of evolved into that, you know, um, using the fresh produce, fruits and vegetables and just cooking in a simple way, in a quick way so that people could eat quickly and go back to work. That's kind of what xiaoqi was and that's a really real way to experience Taiwanese food. So in like maybe three words, what are some words to you, you use to describe Taiwanese food? Hmm. There's, oh gosh, this is so hard to explain, but basically I think the essence of Taiwanese food is it looks simple, but it's not. A simple sauce has like hundreds of his, years of history behind it. A little tong yu bing takes so long to make, the kind of scallion that they choose, the way they knead the dough, and there's just so much hidden behind what looks simple. And we want to uncover that and show that story to everybody. That sounds good. I can't, uh, <laughs> I'm getting hungry now. <laughs> uh, we're going to take a break. Okay. And uh, when we come back, I want to ask you about your world tour around the world because oh. <laughs> uh, you had to go around the world to come back to Taiwanese food. Yes, yes. So stay tuned. We'll have more with Lily and Lynn. Welcome back to Game Changers with Emily Waiwu. I'm sitting here with Lillian. She's a co-owner of Yunhai Taiwanese Pantry, who's making Taiwanese food really hip in North America. And Lillian, this taste of curation and design and storytelling, this wasn't acquired overnight. <laughs> you actually, exactly. yeah, you actually had to go around the world to come back. So let's talk about how you got here. I'm really excited because there are some bits and pieces about your history that are so interesting to me. So you actually had a cozy job in consulting Yes. <laughs> and then you turn into food business. You're a line cook, you had a food stand. Yeah. First of all, how did your parents react to this? <laughs> I think I made the decision without telling them at first. And I was like, hey, I think I'm gonna leave consulting and go try some food stuff. And they were like, okay. And they were, you know, like skeptically supportive. And I'm really grateful for that, for sure. 
So I did consulting for about three years and I realized, you know, I learned a lot about business, about strategy, about operations, but ultimately it wasn't what I wanted to do, staying up till 2 a.m. in the morning, just making a rich company a little bit richer. Just wasn't what motivated me anymore. And I had like a little quarter life crisis where I was like, what should I do? I wrote down all these things I was interested in and where, what I wanted to try and food was one of the things. And you know, when I was consulting even, during all my spare time, I was thinking about food and how to find food and reading about food and I realized, oh, what if I just made that my job and tried it out? So you were 25? and you were in New York City and you opened up a poutine food stand. Yes, so when I was consulting, I used to go to a project in Vermont, so right next to the border of Canada, close to Montreal, and there people eat poutine all the time. It's just kind of like in Texas, everyone eats tacos, which is close to Mexico. And every time we go back to New York, there just wasn't any really good poutine there. There were a few stores, but not a lot. And so a friend and I uh, decided to try and open up a poutine stand to try and bring our favorite poutine to New York. And then you had a really cool job after that. Yeah, so after that, um, I went and worked at a subscription box company. So the idea behind that company is every month, we would send you a box of food from a different country. So in the box, there will be maybe about seven or eight different food items. And my job was to find all the food in the box and negotiate all the purchases and import it to the States. By find, you mean you actually flew to the country <laughs> to sample the food. Yes, it was definitely the best job I've ever had till this day. Um, every, other, every month or two, I get a new country to think about and I would go research that country as much as I could in New York City, which is already a great place to start. And then we'd actually travel to the country, meet all the food vendors, negotiate all the deals, sample as much food, create as much content as we can, and then bring it back to the States. Did you ever curate Taiwanese food at the time? <laughs> so it was always my goal to slip in a Taiwanese food here or there. So one year we had a holiday box that we actually collaborated with the Michelin Guide. And I put in some Song Lisu pineapple cakes into that box. Yeah. Um, all right, speaking of Michelin actually, so then later on you worked at a world-class food group. I'll let you brag about this part. <laughs> so I worked at Myers USA, which was Klaus Meyer's restaurant group. Um, Klaus Meyer was one of the co-founders of Noma and kind of the godfather of Nordic cuisine. Noma as in the best restaurant in the world. <laughs> that, that one. Yes, that one. <laughs> yes. Um, and while he's no longer involved with Noma, he's still you know, a huge player in the Nordic food scene. And he came to New York to open a restaurant group and we had uh, a food hall and a one Michelin star restaurant in Grand Central Station, the train station in the middle of New York, and also you know, a handful of other restaurants uh, across the city. Yeah. I mean, that experience from food stand to kind of a food on the go to Michelin star restaurants. You know, I had done, you know, work for a Danish restaurant group. I cooked at a Japanese ramen place. I did Canadian poutine, uh, but I had always wanted to do Taiwanese food as well. So yeah. finally I got my chance. Yeah, what made you want to do that? I mean, that's a, to go around the world, just to come back, right? To your hometown, to say, I'm going to make a difference here and bring this food to the world and solve these logistical issues for independent producers, like how, how did you make that change? Yeah, so I think it's it's very personal as well. Um, I moved back to Taiwan um, during COVID for about a year and a half. You know, when you're in Taiwan, I don't know if you feel this way, but you feel super patriotic when you're in Taiwan. You're hearing like, Taiwan's the best, Taiwan makes the best this, 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 and that. And also in Taiwan, I saw all these cool people like yourself doing really great entrepreneurial work. Um, and that was really inspiring. And I had always wanted to do Taiwanese food, you know, after doing all this other food. So being in Taiwan was the perfect way to kind of develop that um, food while I'm in Taiwan. And now I'm back in the US, I can really promote the food that I've developed while I was here. Yeah, I really love the work you guys do. And I'm looking back and I, I just remember the many times that somebody says, oh, I love this food, but where can I get it because I'm in the States? Mm -hmm. And they could come back to, uh, to Taiwan and buy a lot of boxes, it's very heavy, right? Yeah. And then somebody would say, no, 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 actually they're on this platform. They're, they already oh. have logistics. And it was you guys, Oh. right? Or I would look at, um, you know, um, BuzzFeed and Tasty, the, these really um, popular global mm -hmm. food sites and wonder, why don't we have that um, yeah. Taiwanese food? Yeah. And I realized, no, wait, you guys are doing it. <laughs> yeah, I mean, we're really trying to tell the story of Taiwan. And I think food is our channel of doing that. Uh, food is an easy way to connect to people and in a very sort of innocuous way, like try this. 
And they're like, oh, why does it taste like this? Well, here's the whole history. And now we get to say to our American friends, you know, go over there and check out how cool Taiwanese food is. <laughs> yes, exactly. That's the dream. Now, before we let you go to go back to San Francisco, there's a question that we ask everybody here, um, which is out of all your accomplishments so far, how much do you think was given to you versus how much did you have to fight for? Yeah, so I think I have a lot of people to thank for where I am today. Um, maybe two big ones. One, obviously my parents, you know, they gave me the education and kind of the emotional freedom and some financial support as well to let me make the choices that I want to make. And so with their kind of support, I was able to say, I don't want to do this corporate job. Um, I want to kind of follow my own dreams and passions. And, you know, my parents are actually, you know, my dad's a journalist, my mom's a pianist, and they both follow their hobbies and were able to make it. And so that made me feel like I can also pursue my hobby, which is food, and try and do something out of that. Um, another really important aspect, I think, of what's making Yunhai successful is actually all the immigrants that came before us. Those first Cantonese immigrants, Taishan immigrants that went to the U.S. opened the first Chinese supermarkets. They paved the way for us to be able to come in now and create this renaissance. You know, you can't have a renaissance without having something before. You know, they set up the shipping way, you know, the, the shipping containers. They introduced Chinese food to the U.S. so that now we can deepen that knowledge for everyone else. So we could only really be here today because of those first generation immigrants that sort of trailblaze the way for us. I'm really glad you mentioned that. I mean, you walk around Taiwan, you, you, you look at this beautiful democracy that we have. None of this was possible. It yeah. would have been possible if not for the people that fought for this freedom before us. Yeah, exactly. Well, that's a wrap for today. Thank you so much for tuning in and thank you Lillian for being with us today. Um, it's been really nice hearing from you firsthand of how you are a part of Inhai and how the company is making Taiwanese food, well, first of all, hit, but also finding another outlet for Taiwanese food in the world. Um, something that I'm hoping could spread to all different industries. Now, if this is your first time tuning in, do check out our other episodes and other game changers. And or if you're also a game changer in your country, if you also work in storytelling for your country, please get in touch with Julian or get in touch with me. Now you can find us on our social medias. And as always, this is Game Changers with Emily Waiwu and you're watching Taiwan Plus. Do check us out, follow and subscribe to all shows on Taiwan Plus. We'll see you next time.